Coming up, we pay tribute to the biggest selling album by a band who broke through as an opening act for KISS, eventually being crowned as the, the most technically proficient band of the rock era. An unboxing of the Super Deluxe Edition 40th Anniversary Moving Pictures box set is next, plus a breakdown of the album coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey Music Junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever imagined that you were the mighty Neil Peart playing the air drums on the dashboard of your car, you really need to subscribe below right now to this channel. You'll dig it. Uh, the stories straight from the legends, stories about the greatest songs and artists in, in history. We also have a Patreon that you definitely need to check out. We have cool stuff there. You're not going to find anywhere else. Rush recorded 19 studio albums from 1974 to 2012, all of them impactful in different ways for the band's multitude of devoted followers. If one asked a Rush fan to name their favorite Rush album, the answer would undoubtedly be based solely on how a particular record impacted their life, especially in the moment. But naming the biggest selling Rush album, that's not open to subjective interpretation. The biggest all-time selling album for Rush was their grand 1981 achievement, Moving Pictures. Since 2020, Moving Pictures has sold close to 7 million units around the world with more than 5 million of those copies purchased here in the US. Now, the LP soared to number three in the UK and on the Billboard 200 album chart, and it topped the album chart in the band's native Canada. The 40th anniversary of Moving Pictures is being celebrated in a super deluxe edition 40th anniversary box set, and it's incredible, to say the very least. We'll unbox a special reissue of Moving Pictures on this episode of Professor of Rock, and we're going to highlight some of the many treasures that are essential collectibles for Rush Rats. So after a very rewarding tour of their album Permanent Waves, Alex Lifeson, Geddy Lee, and Neil Peart were riding a high. They followed suit on how they recorded Permanent Waves, Living and raising families in Canada, they continued recording in the Canadian forest between English Canada and French Canada. Alex Lifeson would say in an interview, we went out to Ronnie Hawkins' farm out in the Stony Lake area. I guess it's just north of Petersboro. Ronnie had a really nice little home up there, you know, nice cottage with a big barn on it. Now we converted the barn into the suite and set Neil's drums up and had areas for Getty and myself, and it was really nice locations. The band ended up staying there that summer and they're writing and rehearsing all their songs for the album. And then they moved to the studio that fall to record it. Rock's Holy Trinity felt the urge to get back into the studio immediately uh, you know, to record a new album, completely altering a two-year schedule that the, the band's manager and producer had strategized for the band, including a plan to engineer Rush's second live album. Ultimately, manager Ray Daniels and producer Terry Brown decided not to stifle the band's passion, though. Peart was especially enthusiastic about making a, a new studio record, and his, his zeal it, it, uh, lit a fire uh, under Lee and Lifeson. The band would later say that at that time, there was just something very strong and positive about the record. Not exactly effortless, mind you, but the effort seemed very smooth. They would have guests visit, and they had a lot of fun uh, across this whole process. They were very, like I said, enthusiastic about carrying on the concept that was visited from the last album. Alex would also say it was really exciting because instead of one story, you had five stories in the same time span, but you would link them with a sentiment or with an idea. A little less so with permanent waves, but more so with moving pictures. The whole idea of a collection of short stories uh, that's what we were after, and that's what Moving Pictures is. So when the three of them began working on Moving Pictures in the studio in Marin Heights, the studio, I guess, had recently been updated with a digital 48-track machine, which was foreign territory for Rush, and it necessitated the band and production crew to familiarize themselves with you know, the cutting-edge equipment, which... Rush did a lot. As a matter of fact, Moving Pictures would be Terry Brown's first digitally produced album. Uh, during the Moving Pictures sessions, the band experimented with uh, pressure zone microphones that uh, pick up direct sounds and no reverberated signals. Actually, Peart 
uh, taped a pressure zone mic to his chest as he played his drum parts in the studio. Now, the audio capture from the pressure zone mic was used to pick up the ambiance that was created in the recording booth for the final mixes of the album. Peart also strapped in a pressure zone mic for the filming of the music videos for the songs Vital Signs and Red Barchetta, a track that was recorded in just one take. extra time needed to become proficient with the new sound gear led to some compatibility issues. It caused the overall recording schedule to fall uh, three days behind, I believe. Following their mantra for ensuring the quality of their music was never compromised, Rush made a conscious effort to preserve the music as much as possible. Extra precautions were taken to protect the music, such as uh, transferring finished song parts onto a fresh piece of tape and putting the original copy of the recordings in storage, thus reducing potential damage from frequent playback. Now the first cut on moving pictures is the riveting Rush trademark, Tom Sawyer. We've covered Tom Sawyer before in depth. We'll link to it below, but just a, a hallmark of the unique collaboration between Peart and Pie Du Bois, the lyricist for Max Webster. Not only was the song loosely based on Mark Twain's beloved character from the book, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, written in 1876, the song also evolved from the Max Webster song, Lewis the Warrior. Although Tom Sawyer became a quintessential song for Rush, Getty Lee stated that the band hated the track when they first recorded it. Getty and his bandmates, they were disappointed in what they heard in the studio, thinking that they didn't capture the true spirit of the song. Surprisingly, they thought it was the worst song on the record at the time of its recording. In fact, they didn't officially accept the song and greenlight it for moving pictures until the sound of the track all came together in the final mix. Getty added that there are times when an artist simply doesn't have the objectivity to know when they're doing their best work. And Tom Sawyer was a good example of that misjudgment. Even after the inclusion of Tom Sawyer on Moving Pictures, the three members of Rush didn't foresee the appeal of the song with their fans. They had no idea that Tom Sawyer would connect with the audiences and enduring Rush signature track. The legacy of Tom Sawyer is much more consequential than the chart positions garnered in 81. The single was number 24 in Canada, number 25 in the UK, and of course number 44 on the Billboard Hot 100. Much bigger than its chart position. Tom Sawyer peaked at number eight on the mainstream rock chart, but along with the Spirit of Radio, ranks as one of the band's most popular classic rock tracks played on radio all the time. Track number two is another deeply personal Neil Peart composition titled Red Barchetta. Inspired by uh, Richard S. Foster's short story, A Nice Morning Drive, it was originally written in the November 1973 edition of the magazine, The Road and Track. In Peart's revision of the story, a man takes a Barchetta on a fast ride, defying the legal speed limit, and ends up in a high-speed chase uh, with the police. Instead of an MGB Roadster as featured in the original story, though, Peart reported the Ferrari 166 MM Marchetta was the car that inspired the song's title. In 2007, Foster and Peart met for the first time and shared their mutual interest of BMW motorcycles, which was documented in an article titled The Drummer, The Private Eye, and Me. The next track on side one of Moving Pictures is the Grammy Award nominated instrumental YYZ. YYZ is the International Air Transport Association's airport code for Toronto, Pearson uh, International Airport. The Morse code of the letters YYZ was incorporated into the song's arrangement of a 5-4 time signature. YYZ opens with Neil Peart playing the Morse code on chimes. The final cut on side one is Peart's autobiographical Limelight, 
about the band's struggles managing their growing fame in the late 70s and the subsequent intrusion from random people into their personal lives. Particularly Neil's unbearable anxiety when he was confronted by adoring fans. Again, we covered, uh, did like a 20 minute episode just on Limelight and I'll link to it. But Limelight was Russia's second highest charting song on the Canadian singles chart at number 18 and it uh, rose to number four in the mainstream rock chart. Thus ends one of the most perfect sides in history, side one of moving pictures. Side two uh, launches with an audio clip from the 1978 action adventure film Superman starring Christopher Reeve. It's the beginning of the two part track, The Camera Eye. The first part was Neil Peart expressing the dichotomy of walking down the mean streets of New York City, uh, catching the pulse and purposeful stride of the city while feeling the, the wrench of its hard realities. The second part was Neil's musings about strolling down streets of London with wide angle observation of the city's rich history. Neil found London uh, wistful and weathered, but still alive with head lifting pride from its storied past. Now, the dark and foreboding uh, witch hunt, that's the next track on Moving Pictures. Peart parallels the horrifying injustice of the Salem witch trials with the intolerance of the moral majority zealots of the 70s and 80s. Great song. The vigilantes gather on. Of course, superbly written by Peart as usual. He calls out those who fear outsiders and those that are strangers to the status quo. Those who know what's best for us must rive and save us from ourselves. Getty Lee's scathing narration is hair raising on witch hunt. Must rise and save us from ourselves. As is Alex Lifeson's grim Reaper guitar riffs. The night is black without a moon. Moving Pictures concludes with the high tech sounds of Vital Signs, featuring a sequence segment produced by an Oberheim OBX synthesizer. Vital Signs represented the band's passion for reggae, something that was first manifested on the Permanent Waves album and uh, integrated more extensively on the two albums that followed. Moving Pictures was indeed a, a modern rock triumph for Rush and the Super Deluxe Edition 40th Anniversary box set not only honors that achievement, it expands it with a, an amazing presentation of just Irresistible, just precious collectibles. The 40th anniversary issue is a three CD deluxe that includes Russia's complete unreleased hometown concert in Toronto from March 25th, 1981, and the 2015 remastering of the Moving Pictures CD for the first time. It was previously only available on vinyl and uh, digitally. Oh, and there's plenty of vinyl too. A five LP vinyl box set to be exact. The booklet and the package features new Hugh Syme illustrations and sleeve notes by Kim Thiel, Les Claypool, Bill Kelleher, and Neil Sanderson, and uh, the late Taylor Hawkins. Gotta check that out. Another cool item inside the 40th anniversary box set is the Blu-ray audio disc featuring moving pictures and Dolby Atmos and a new 5.1 surround album mix. The Blu-ray contains a brand new video for YYZ along with promos for Tom Sawyer, Limelight, and Vital Signs. This is a tremendous box set, one of the best that I've ever seen. You'll find all kinds of other bonus goodies in here as well. There's the 44-page hardcover book along with two Neil Peart signature MP-branded drumsticks, a pair of two metal embossed guitar picks, one with Getty Lee's signature and the other with Alex Lifeson's signature engraved on it. I mean, I can just keep going and going. There's also, this is actually probably the coolest thing in here, there's a Red Barchetta model, moving pictures posters, and a replica of the Moving Pictures 1981 official tour program. The Super Deluxe Edition 40th Anniversary Moving Pictures box set is just bursting with sights, sounds, and artistic characters that made Rush 
One of the greatest bands of the rock era, no doubt about it. It was Russia's ultimate foray into the 80s. I mean, though Permanent Waves was released in 1980, it was recorded in the 70s. Moving Pictures was the album that put Rush into the, the cultural lexicon, into the, to the limelight, if you will. <laughs> Neil Peart would talk about how the album hit at the summer with the right kind of music. He would reminisce how he would hear tracks like Red Barchetta on the, the radio and being somewhat surprised. As he would also say, a lot of 70s bands that Rush started out with, they didn't survive the new wave 80s, as many would have to learn to adapt to a new sound, a new reality. he go on to say, we were light on our feet because Rush had no preconceived notion of what we were supposed to be. We were not a hardcore rock ballad band or, or something, and our hair was subject to change. So many of the bands of the 70s, they were all what they seemed to be in the true sense. And if you take that away, what were they going to do? Rush couldn't be a new wave band or a punk group or a, even transition to pop. They could be themselves, though. They were unfashionable, admittedly. They were always just on the edge of the mainstream. Without compromising their vision, ever. They always did exactly what they wanted to do, and they made the music that they wanted to make, that they were passionate about. It was music with integrity, with depth, with soul. They truly were the spirit of radio. Make sure to pick up the 40th anniversary edition of Moving Pictures. The link is below. And leave us a comment about this masterpiece of an album, Moving Pictures. What are your memories of it? What are your memories of the songs? What are your takes on the songs? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our other episodes of Rush. Uh, we've got Limelight, and we've got one on Tom Sawyer and the Spirit of Radio. Make sure that you subscribe as well so you never miss out on our daily videos. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>